I'm Michael Kirby and I came to this law school at the University of Sydney uh, in February of 1959 and uh, that was the beginning of my life in the law and I went on to become President of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales and then a Justice of the High Court of Australia uh, and I've never regretted my choice of law and I've never regretted coming to the University of Sydney School of Law. So the, um, the Human Genome Diversity Project was among many of your interests at that stage and it, uh, it seems to me that, uh, that uh, you've always had this strong interest in uh, social justice and rights. And if I can take you back, please, Michael, to um, the beginnings, as it were now, to your um, uh, days at uh, Sydney University. And um, um, what were the key influences uh, on your time there? Uh, I know uh, Julius Stone was certainly one of them. Can we uh, hear more about that, please? I came to the Sydney Law School, uh, which was then in Phillips Street in Sydney, uh, in a rather Dickensian building, I'm afraid. Um, not the modern glass uh, and uh, um, modernity which the Sydney Law School is now, where we are filming this interview. Uh, and uh, I came in February of 1958. I had done two years uh, of um, education in the Faculty of Arts, Psychology, Philosophy and uh, the English Language and Poetry. Uh, and then I came in the third year to the uh, Sydney Law School in Phillips Street, Sydney. Uh, and uh, it was a very different setup. I mean, the, the campus was a traditional university campus with magnificent buildings and uh, it hadn't been spoiled by many of the uh, new buildings that have been put on the campus in recent years. But um, uh, we were then a group of about 100 students. Only about um, 10 of the 100, maybe even fewer, were women. So it was really a, a rather male environment mm. and most of those who entered it had been educated in expensive private schools. I had been educated at, at a great school, Ford Street High School, uh, but it was a public school and so to that extent I was a, a, a minority. But um, the faculty was deeply divided as we found very soon after we arose because young people are very sensitive to differences and disputes. Uh, and uh, it's true that Professor Julius Stone, who had been educated at Oxford, Leeds first, then Oxford, uh, and then in Auckland, uh, he became Dean of Law and then he came over uh, during the early days of the Second World War to Sydney and he was not the Dean in Sydney but he was a very distinguished professor of international law and jurisprudence. The Dean was Professor Kenneth Shadwell who had come up uh, from uh, the University of Tasmania. Uh, his area was contract law uh, and he was quite a congenial sort of a person, uh, but he was no match for the, the extremely talented and bright members of the faculty. Uh, Frank Hutley, who later became my colleague on the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, uh, and um, uh, Frank Hutley, who later became my colleague on the Court of Appeal, uh, Bill Morrison, William uh, Lutit Morrison, who was the Professor of Common Law and Torts, and Ross Parsons, who was the Professor of um, Company Law and Taxation. 
So there was a big gulf between the world view of those three gentlemen and Professor Julia Stone. Uh, in a real sense, the three common law professors um, were um, not sympathetic to the, the, the view that Julius Stone had of the law. Mm. Julius Stone taught that in our legal system, especially judges uh, in appellate courts, have what he called leeways for choice. Mm. The ambiguity of uh, the language of a constitution or the ambiguity of expressions used by judges in the past in common law cases, uh, the ambiguity of criminal sentencing uh, and discretionary decisions meant judges played a, a significant, a very significant role, uh, whereas the common law professors reflected the then orthodox view of Sir Owen Dixon, mm. who was at that time a justice and later chief justice of the High Court of Australia, who believed that the law would have lost its meaning if, it, if things depended on judicial choices. Mm. And so he said, all you need really is the magic password so that you can open the cave and find the one objectively correct conclusion to a case. Julius Stone said, that's a fairy story. And, uh, and therefore, there was this battle. In that battle, in the legal profession uh, of Australia and Sydney, uh, the overwhelming majority of lawyers accepted what Sir Owen Dixon said and what uh, the common law professors said, but uh, Julius Stone did not. And Julius Stone gradually but surely had a huge impact on the minds of young lawyers, including my mind. And when later it became a search amongst academic lawyers, why did the High Court suddenly start uh, re-expressing the law. Why did it come to the conclusion in Marbo against Queensland uh, that was uh, finding a, a right to traditional lands of the indigenous people? Um, the explanation was basically that the majority of justices of the High Court came to be people who at the Sydney Law School had been students of Julia Stone. That certainly would be my view, and it certainly was the impact on me. Uh, I thought what Julia Stone was teaching us uh, had the ring of truthfulness and empiricism, uh, and what uh, was being propounded as the one true doctrine that you only had to have the, the magical key words to get to, was a fairy story. Mm. And, uh, so that was a big difference in the law school and people felt very deeply about it. Lawyers maybe didn't have as many things as political scientists and uh, uh, philosophers to dispute about, but they did have this big issue. And, and that big issue led to personal grievances mm. and differences in the faculty and that was reflected in the atmosphere of the law school. It was a very divided place, very divided. Mm. Uh, a bit like it's often said the disputes in amongst theologians is in reverse proportion to the significance of the matters they disagree about. Uh, and certainly the disputes in the law school were rather bitter and as I progressed as a law student I uh, became more and more connected with Julius Stone and his very small unit in jurisprudence and public international law which was on I think 
level three of the building in Phillips Street, Sydney, which was the, um, the faculty of hall of the University of Sydney. Uh, but they hated each other and they were nasty to each other. And of course, sensitive students coming into this environment uh, could detect it. It was in the vibes and therefore they felt uh, anxious at first but then they accepted that this was just the difference of view and uh, you had effectively to make choices and to decide which one you believed in. The majority of the profession believed in the Dixonian view mm. but many people who came through the hands of Sydney Law School uh, embraced uh, Julia Stone's point of view and I was one of them. So this was a very real issue that ramified right throughout the student body as well as the, uh, the teachers and the, uh, and the staff of the law school, this uh, division, if you like, between um, what one might call perhaps a more um, cosmopolitan uh, philosophical view of the law that has uh, dimensions in, in the, moral, the moral issues that we, that we saw played out in the Marvo decision. Um, and uh, I wonder too um, to what extent uh, the directions through, uh, through the 60s when you were there, um, including up to and including your masters, uh, the directions were then uh, um, played out what, what was the um, predominant way that the law school was heading in that, uh, in that sense. Well, the differences were certainly very keenly felt when we arrived uh, and, of course, there were some conservative law students, most of whom came from rather wealthy parents and private school education, not public schools like my education, uh, and they rather embraced the, um, the Dixonian complete and absolute legalism, uh, but increasingly people uh, adopted what was called legal realism, mm. uh, and uh, I was one of those who did so. Julius Stone kept a filing system in which he made notes of the students of every, uh, every year that he was teaching at the Sydney Law School. And uh, I've heard that his notes on me suggested that I had great promise. Um, that probably meant great promise in embracing legal realism. Uh, and eventually <clears throat> he selected, uh, he, he, he did play favourites a bit, and he selected people who he thought were realist and did embrace legal realism to help him in uh, revising and updating his very important text in jurisprudence called The Province and Function of Law. Mm. It had been privately published by the Maitland Press, which I think Julius owned, uh, and um, it was a, a world famous book. And I was chosen to uh, help him on a chapter which dealt with the Marxian view of law, Karl Marx's view of law, uh, which was the official philosophy of the then Soviet Union. Mm. Um, I think he chose me because he thought I would stimulate his mind by being a little bit closer to uh, the Marxian view, Marxist view. Uh, and uh, it was true that my grandmother had married a man uh, for the second time, so her second marriage, who was the national treasurer of the Australian Communist Party. Mm. And uh, therefore, and I knew him as a human being, and he was a very fine man, a soldier at Gallipoli who threw away his medals uh, and his Catholic beliefs and became a communist. Um, but uh, whatever the reason that Julius chose me and chose me for that particular chapter of his 
second edition of his book. Um, I don't know. But anyway, he, he apparently was very uh, impressed by my performance uh, and I did a lot of work to help him in the book on that chapter. Uh, I was myself being realistic, rather sceptical about the way the communists had adopted a principle that the law would wither away mm. with the advent of communism. It certainly hadn't withered away in the Soviet Union. It had rather developed with all the other power structures in order to advance the autocracy that was uh, the Soviet Union of uh, Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, and everyone up to Mikhail Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, uh, I wrote, I helped Julius, I did drafts, and the drafts were based upon um, translations which had been undertaken by one of his colleagues, um, Dr. Ilmar Tamilo. Yes, I've seen that name. Tamilo was uh, born in Estonia. Uh, he had been, he received his legal education in Germany during the last days of the 1930s. So he lived through the Nazi regime and he lived through uh, the, uh, uh, the Stalinist regime in uh, Estonia. Uh, and uh, he uh, was multilingual, as most people in that part of Europe are, mm -hmm. and he translated hundreds of um, op-eds, chapters in books, uh, and so on, about the uh, views of Karl Marx on the withering away of the state. Uh, and my job was to synthesize these essays, I mean they were all over his room in uh, Phillips Street, uh, they were piles of them and I had to read them and of course uh, they had uh, speeches by uh, Stalin and by Nikita Khrushchev and extracts from the writings of V.I. Lenin and uh, the more I read them the more I realised that this was being realistic, that this was a kind of state religion and not all that different from oppressive religious views, this philosophical Marxist point of view, that the state would wither away, that was, that was the expression, mm. I don't know what it is in German, but it, it would wither away and that was so unrealistic in the Soviet Union where the state had grown enormously in power Absolutely. and oppression of the people. Very interesting. So um, anyway, I helped Julius. Julius said in the foreword or preface to the second edition that he paid a tribute to Michael Kirby for helping him uh, and he didn't know whether in the end um, uh, I had agreed with his view, but in the likelihood is that being a realist, I, I would, felt if anything he was a bit too kind to the communists. But anyway, uh, that put me into contact with Julius and therefore in the lineup of the law school, I was more on his side than mm -hmm. I was on the side of Morrison and Hutley and uh, Parsons. But uh, it was a great opportunity for me. And later, I did a Master of Laws degree, and my thesis was on the Marxist view of the withering away the state. The state, and I further developed the work that I had done for Julius Stone and for his book uh, as my thesis. I'm fascinated um, by by this, particularly because um, uh, I, I've done a bit of work on Leonard Adam. The um, the um, Jewish, German Jewish uh, legal scholar who was at Melbourne University in the um, 50s and 60s. Um, and he was, I, I called my article um, The Outsider Anthropologist. Adam was an anthropologist 
we Please. just not, no pro maga uh, got them uh, novel maker not novel maker uh, Leonard Adam what was his name Leonard Adam no I didn't know him I can send you my, my piece if you're interested oh I'd be interested um, to see that we were both early students <laughs> of the Soviet religion yes uh, and so Leonard Adam uh, just coming to, to this point about um, Stone and those kind of uh, influences and uh, and also uh, Wilma Tamela. It, uh, Leonard Adam was a, a European cosmopolitan scholar coming to Australia. He was on the Denera, he was a Denera boy. Oh, yes. And he arrived in, in Australia, it's a, it's a long story, but I'll send you my piece. Um, and I became fascinated because Adam was very much in a way an outsider in Melbourne University, which didn't have um, an interdisciplinary, didn't have an interdisciplinary uh, scholarly community. It had, uh, I suppose, it had well, law, the law school was under the deanship of uh, Sir George Payton, I think. He yes. was uh, quite an intelligent man. I think he went on to become a vice chancellor, but he was uh, very conservative. Mm. Most of the people in law schools were very conservative. That's right. And I wasn't very conservative because I'd grown up uh, in a family where. I met Jack Simpson, uh, who was the national treasurer of the Communist Party. And in a world in which communists were denounced and uh, the government introduced legislation to take away their civil rights, um, I, I uh, was highly skeptical of this. And I was very affectionate towards my grandmother's second husband. He, 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 taught me really that you have to be very sceptical about uh, the moods of politicians and political uh, uh, political issues and you have to scrutinise things um, on empirical data and that's what Ilmar wanted to do. Julius was a legal philosopher so he was quite happy to talk about issues in terms of principle and history and so on. But Ilmar wanted to get out all these thousands of speeches by Nikita Khrushchev. And I remember uh, in many of them, they would have, at a certain point in the speech, in brackets, applause. And then in brackets, uh, lengthy applause. And then in brackets, uh, thunderous applause. <laughs> this was... <laughs> Uh, this was the falsity of the Marxist communist approach. But equally false was the notion uh, of, of Dixon that legal decisions were just on legal analysis of words uh, and not affected by values uh, and opinions uh, and uh, philosophy. Yes, that's uh, that's um, the fascinating thing is uh, why I brought up Leonard, Leonard Adams because uh, my um, question or uh, inquiry is really goes to questions about diversity and difference and outsiderness and Sydney, New South Wales during the 1960s, um, there was still that conservatism stemming from the 50s from the men's era. Um, and the law school was, if, 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 in a way, a bastion of conservatism in some ways, oh, as yes, was Melbourne University. But you had these um, these uh, individuals who came from uh, cosmopolitan European or diverse backgrounds who had a sense of outsiderness. Outsiderness. Julius Stone was Jewish. He was, had suffered anti-Semitism. I, I, I'm Jewish myself, so I had this interest in, in those kind well, of. That was the time of the Nazis and. Uh, and of the Holocaust. So, I mean, uh, it was natural that this should be very much on his mind. Jules was also a Zionist, and that led to battles within the Jewish community. Um, so Isaac Isaacs, who was a very distinguished Jewish Australian, who became a Justice of the High Court of Australia, and then the Governor General, the first Australian Governor General, against the resistance of King George V. Uh, but he was not a Zionist. He was opposed to Zionism. Mm. There was that division. Yes. We would not have used the word cosmopolitan 
understand where you're coming from, but Ilma uh, would have been a cos cosmopolitan. I'm not sure that Julius, who grew up in Leeds and uh, was educated at Oxford, mm -hmm. uh, would have regarded himself as tainted by cosmopolitanism. I'm not sure. sure. I never okay. talked about that. Sure. But um, he was insistent uh, on essentially the Roscoe Pound theory of realism. And he taught uh, Roscoe Pound was a professor of law in Nebraska and then later dean of law at Harvard. And he had been there when Julius went there uh, to teach law and I believe narrowly missed out on being elected the dean of law at, um, uh, at Harvard in succession to Roscoe Pound. So if you knew Julius's background, you would understand his, uh, his concern about the anti-Semitism. You would understand his embrace of Zionism uh, and you would understand his legal realism because that was affected not by his training in Oxford, which was as in Owen Dixon's view, uh, really not the key to the kingdom, which mm -hmm was the view that um, Julius embraced of legal realism and just facing up to what judges do. And I mean, in my time as a, a president of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales, later as uh, Justice of the High Court of Australia, when you came out of court uh, after hearing a thorough argument by brilliant counsel, you would always virtually always, always, go for the jugular. We would go for the values that mm. were at stake because the law and words didn't provide a solution in the complex factual situation and complex legal situation. And therefore, you had to talk about and iron out the different values. And those values were evident in, in appellate courts because the judges had the responsibility to give meaning to ambiguous words and, uh, uh, and to uh, ambiguous legal doctrine. And that's what Julius taught. And, and what Ilmar Tamerlo, from a more cosmopolitan European background, was also teaching. Was Julius had a lot of invitations to go overseas. He was a sort of rock star uh, of professors of jurisprudence. Um, he would go overseas and take, uh, rather, uh, Stone would go overseas and Tamala would take his lecturing duties. Okay. And also a young uh, lecturer uh, who was uh, in that small group on level three of the law school building, uh, they were uh, Julius Stone heading it up, Ilmar Tamalo, uh, who uh, I don't think was appointed a professor uh, by Sydney University, but who was very influential on his students and his sweet personality won a lot of affection for him. Mm. I wouldn't say Julius Stone uh, built up a lot of affection. He built up a lot of respect. Mm. Uh, Ilmar built up his respect, but also affection, because he was a very sweet, gentle personality. And he lived through uh, the Nazi and Soviet periods in Estonia uh, and uh, the post-war uh, occupation of Estonia and the other uh, Baltic states and he had this, these piles of English language translations, and these thunderous applause speeches, and uh, that was my job to get the essence of it and to help Julius with the benefit of lots of foot footnotes, because Julius loved footnotes. Mm. Uh, he could have been a good historian. He yes. liked footnotes. And he, he, he would write using the material that I'd synthesized 
that was a great experience for a young uh, law student because mm. I was then only, uh, I suppose, uh, 20, 21. Mm. And this is a chance that Julius gave me. And there in his uh, little card system were words uh, of praise, but also a, a degree of scepticism about me. He thought I was uh, too sympathetic for a Marxist point of view, and he attributed to me a, a, a view that would be more sympathetic to the, the uh, rubbish that the politicians of the Soviet Union were putting forward, no doubt written for them by their staffers, uh, that was designed to give them a position as a guru of Marxist philosophy. Mm. Gave all of that to me, and I went down then and I turned it into material for Julius, which he acknowledged, and I turned it into an article for uh, the uh, Journal of Law and Philosophy, Internationale Vereinigung für Rechts- und Sozialphilosophy, and that uh, led on to my thesis, uh, the dissertation for my. Master of Law's degree. Mm. But the, um, the third person in this uh, heavenly trio was um, Tony Black. Black mm. He was a young uh, lecturer. Uh, my brother, David, who uh, studied law along with my brother Don, David has said Blackshear was the best lecturer he ever heard. He, he was very engaging and uh, very dynamic. And uh, there was also Professor Charles, um, Charles uh, Adonovich, I think it was, uh, and uh, Otto Bondi. Uh, so we're building up a cosmopolitan group. Otto Bondi? Bondi, B-O-N-D-Y. Okay. Uh, he was a refugee from Austria. Mm. And I once went when I was attending the global uh, Salzburg seminar, I went to an address I'd been given and one of those little uh, copper signs was in the footpath because that had been the Bondi home in Salzburg before he fled and got to Australia. Uh, he, he was a Jew, Jewish. Um, Ilmar was not Jewish and Tony Blackshaw was not Jewish, but they gathered together, and Julius gathered together, Jew, the Jewish Australian scholars, mm -hmm. and invited international scholars of renown, and that was something very, very different from the common law departments of the University of Sydney Law School. And, uh, and I think there was a degree of jealousy of Julius Dover. He was a big name in the world of legal uh, education. Um, and he was respected as such by his students, though most of them were content to embrace Sir Alan Dixon's view that, no, that it's not values, it's not choices, uh, it's words, mm -hmm. analysis of words. But um, anyway, that was, uh, I, I in saying all this, uh, I don't want to disparage the talent of the common law professors because there were uh, people who were either in the middle land, like uh, Professor uh, David Benjaville, who unusually for that time was wheelchair bound, uh, and but he was our lecturer on uh, issues of constitutional law. Uh, he, he taught us in the first year uh, and uh, there were other uh, lecturers. Professor Parsons was a very forward-looking lecturer who saw accountants stealing tax law from the legal profession and so he set up 
uh, an institute and uh, invited visiting scholars in the field of tax law. Mm -hmm. And the doyen of the common law departments was Professor William Morrison. And he was one of the greatest lecturers I ever experienced. He's, he had a very fine analytical mind uh, and he taught torts law. Uh, he taught it from the Dixonian approach, mm. but uh, as a very practical subject, unlike jurisprudence and international law, uh, he taught it in, in a way that made it uh, seem a, a, a very consistent fabric uh, made by the judges, but to a charter that they were observing a very modest judicial role, not affected by lead ways for choice. Mm. So we were blessed in, in a sense with highly talented traditionalists of English common law systems. And this exception, who was, it was so impertinent as to challenge the doctrine that had been advanced by the Chief Justice of the High Court or the Justice of the High Court, later Chief Justice, Sir Alan Dixon. Uh, and um, so we had people in both uh, spheres and with both philosophies, uh, and they were very talented people. Mm -hmm. Later, when I was president of the Court of Appeal, I made it my business to invite these professors to have lunch with the judges, most of whom though not all, had been their students uh, to show how we had made good uh, and uh, how we still remember their contributions to our legal development. Mm -hmm. But insofar as there was a division in the law school, I would have been on the side of Julius. And insofar as I was influenced by the teaching of Julius, there were judicial leeways for choice. I was merely one of many who felt that influence and uh, gave effect to it, in mm. my opinion. It's interesting too that um, I've been dipping into A.J. Brown's uh, biography, um, and uh, among your contemporaries were Murray Gleason, for example. Who I, I presume was more on the side of the traditionalists. Would that oh, be? Oh yes, yes. He was more traditionalist, but we shared. He came up to me in first year law, uh, and I had a rather superior view towards him because in the leaving certificate, I had become, I, I had been uh, chosen as first in the state in modern history, and I think I was in the ag aggregate. 23rd, Murray Gleason was about 87 or something low in the list. Mm. And, um, but Murray Gleason came up to me and said, Why don't we share the taking of notes? Mm. Uh, and I said, Do you think that would be a good thing? He said, Yes, you'll do some subjects and I'll do other subjects. And so we did that. Uh, and from uh, first year in law, certainly from second, third, and fourth year, we divided the world. He did company law and taxation. He just loved those subjects. I did constitutional law, which is a philosophical type of law, I think, and um, mm -hmm. jurisprudence and international law. Basically, we chose the areas of law that each of us were interested in, and we became uh, close friends uh, and would have dinner every Friday. Being an observant Catholic, he always had fish with lots of tartar sauce. <laughs> I would have uh, fish as well because I like fish. But, um, uh, and, and I kept those notes and in fact ultimately uh, I sent the binders which have his notes and my notes on the subjects we had severally chosen uh, and I sent them to the National Archives. Somebody will one day 
take them out and look at uh, the different emphasis that we gave to different topics. And they'll see in my notes a strong influence of Julia Stone in legal realism. They'll see in Murray Gleason's notes a strong influence of uh, the common law uh, linguistic approach and uh, the influence of Professors Morrison uh, and Benjafield uh, and, uh, and Professor Yes, there was Parsons, Morris, Benjafield, and also Professor oh, Lane. How many was it? Pat Lane. Oh, Lane. Okay. He was a very good professor who took federal constitutional law. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Benjafield took the subject of general constitutional principles, uh, which was constitutions for many countries. And we studied very closely developments that were happening in South Africa. Harris, uh, and the Minister for the Interior, uh, the early challenges to apartheid in South Africa. And um, so uh, he would do that, but Professor Pat Lane would do the analysis of a rather conservative High Court in the 1950s uh, in federal constitution, Australian federal constitution. But um, so, uh, and our judicial careers ran in tandem. Uh, I got appointed to be president of the Court of Appeal. Uh, first of all, appointed a judge, and then he became a QC, uh, and he appeared before me as a QC. And then I was appointed president of the Court of Appeal, and then he was appointed Chief Justice of New South Wales, so he jumped over mm. me. And I was appointed to the High Court of Australia, and lo and behold, he was then appointed Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, which is very unusual, apart from Chief Justice Griffith, who had been Chief Justice of Queensland. I don't think there was another Chief Justice who had been uh, a Chief Justice of the state. But Anyway, we have slightly different philosophies. That's just how it is in the world. Yes, and uh, coming again to the cohort of fellow students, um, Mary Gordon was also there at the time. Can you speak about her, please? Yes, Mary Gordon is still a good friend of mine. We have uh, lunches together and uh, talk about um, uh, the old days of the glory days. Um, Mary uh, was about four years behind Mary Grace and me. Uh, she's ever so young. And uh, we therefore, I didn't have day-to-day -day contact with her. Later, as a young solicitor, when I was a young barrister, she gave me a few briefs. Mm. Uh, and uh, that established a relationship which is uh, a particular and special relationship uh, and subsequently she was my colleague uh, in the High Court as the first woman appointed to the High Court mm -hmm. as a justice uh, and uh, I often thought that she was more conservative than I even though she would dispute that but one area of the law we had like mind, completely like mind, and that was in the area of the law as it affects the First Nations people. Mm. Um, we never talked about that when I was at university in Sydney Law School, um, but when, once we got in, on the High Court, I don't believe there was ever a case dealing with First Nations people where we either did not write together, such as the Yorta Yorta case, mm. or did not reach the same conclusion, such as the Wick case. Uh, we had a very similar view in 
in that area of the law, and I think her view was influenced by her background coming from Walcott, I think, uh, New South Wales. Yes. Uh, and my, uh, my uh, view, broad view, was influenced by my own sexual orientation. If you, uh, especially at that time, if you uh, were gay, uh, then you suffered serious discrimination, as the indigenous people did. But there was very little talk about indigenous law or indigenous issues. And I never asked a question in class about why we uh, refused as a society to recognise indigenous land rights. Uh, when I came later to serve in student politics, beginning my glorious career on the nomination of Murray Gleeson. He nominated me to uh, serve on the Law Student Society, the Law Society of Sydney University, in the law school for the interests of students. Um, I uh, became more interested in Indigenous law issues and in the so-called APSCOL, Initiative, which was to uh, establish a number of scholarships for Aboriginal students, of whom I think when I started at the Sydney Law School in 1958, mm. there had never been a, a graduate in law. Even the British in Nigeria and Ghana and uh, Caribbean and so on had educated people. Uh, who were indigenous to the area um, or who were of a different race uh, in the law. Mm. And the same was true in India and in most countries of the, uh, of the uh, British Empire, but it wasn't true in Australia. So uh, the Aboriginal people and Aboriginal students suffered real disadvantages. And my way of dealing with that I was in student politics uh, supporting the ABSCOL uh, scholarship, supporting the uh, Asian uh, students who had come to the University of Sydney um, under the Colombo plan mm. uh, and uh, who were an increasing cohort in the University of Sydney uh, and supporting women's rights but nobody, just nobody, ever spoke about uh, LGBT, queer rights, that were never mentioned at all, including by me, because that was so shameful and disgusting that you were expected to keep that all to yourself, which mm. I did at that time. Mm. Yes, I, I, I'm um, certainly fascinated and uh, um, by these, these senses of um, I suppose outrage and uh, a sense of unfairness that uh, that people have have suffered uh, from from backgrounds such as yours and from indigenous backgrounds um, and um, and the, the refugee background and so on and bringing these influences these experiences to to the law school to the that kind of um, um, that that kind of domain. Um, but don't think that this was on the lips of every student. I don't think it was on the lips of any student. Mm. Uh, they didn't talk about indigenous issues. They didn't talk about white Australia. They didn't talk about women's disadvantage. And they certainly didn't talk about LGBT issues. I remember the day that Vernon Triot, who was a QC and a part-time lecturer, teaching us law students in first year, so this would have been 1958, and he was teaching us in the Phillip Street Theatre because the old law school building didn't have enough big rooms mm. and everybody had to do criminal law. So we were all in the plush velvet seats, which at night were theatre performances with Barry Humphreys and others, and in the afternoon uh, were law students sitting there with Vernon Triot. At a certain point, 
he reached the issue of so-called unnatural offences and the punishment of people with quite severe punishment if they were ever caught. And uh, the fact that what they did was in private or was secret uh, to them and uh, was consenting meant nothing. They were, they were not only punished if they were caught, but they were humiliated by uh, newspaper uh, performances. And I've since learned that at about this time, uh, a very nice man who was the Labor Attorney General in New South Wales, Red Downing, he had established uh, the Kuma Jail as a specific jail for gay men. And so far as I know, it's the only jail specific to queer people in the whole world. Yeah. And Reg Downing was such a nice man. And later, when the um, Renshaw government was defeated in 1965, uh, he went back to the bar. And I had many cases uh, against him uh, as a barrister. And he was a very nice, decent man, but he was very faithful to the Roman Catholic Church and its teaching, and that made him uh, very uh, hostile to LGBT people. And most people at that time were hostile. Uh, and you say uh, how uh, those who were subject to this hostility were greatly hurt. Well, I knew that when push came to shove, my parents and my siblings would give me um, undivided love. Mm -hmm. I therefore never felt, as many gay people did in those days, that they would be thrown out of the family or they would suffer um, rejection. I, I never felt that. And also, I had studied, uh, even as a young boy at school, uh, the work of Alfred Kinsey. Mm. Alfred Kinsey in Bloomington, Indiana, in the Indiana University in the United States, who did some of the early work on discovering the realities, the empirical realities about um, queer people and I basically I knew that um, Dr. Kinsey's work showed that I wasn't so odd, that I wasn't so unique, that I wasn't so peculiar uh, and uh, so I, I could never quite take the hostility seriously but I wasn't going to chance my arm to talk about it. I just let people have their own foolish views and mm. <laughs> said nothing about it uh, for a very long time because that is what you were expected to do in those days. And perhaps the strength of your um, your family uh, gave you that uh, that capacity to then to, to, to pursue uh, your 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 um, passion perhaps for for justice and for, across well, all these areas. I, I I don't think that the two were sort of interrelated. In other words, uh, basically I have pushed sexuality out of my, my experience and my thinking. Mm. And I, I, I had rather a lonely uh, teenage period in my life, uh, but I didn't blame anyone because these laws have been around at least since the reign of Henry VIII. Mm. And probably much earlier, uh, and therefore I never expected that they would be changed. I never expected that I would be wearing the wedding ring of my a relationship with my partner, Johan, which has been going on. He's put up with me for 53 and a half years, um, and I never th thought that would change, but it didn't really uh, trouble my inner soul, because I just thought, well, this is just plain unscientific, yeah. as Dr. Kinsey had demonstrated. And one day, uh, people would wake up, and, uh, they would appreciate that. So I just didn't let it bother me. But I 
I didn't have a sexual life, really. Um, and looking back on it, I, I was a bit resentful of that. I should have had more parties and more, <laughs> more um, uh, love affairs and so on. But um, I didn't uh, worry too much about that. And I just got on with trying to do very well in student politics and very well uh, in my academic work. I want to come to the student politics in a moment. I do have scheduled another interview at 12.30 with Jenny Ferns, who was a long time staff in the law school. Um, I don't have her clock with me, it's on the, on the phone on the uh, phone there. Can we just do it? It's 11.21. Oh, that's good, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I want to go to the question of First Nations. Now, Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, but certainly Sydney in the 1960s. We think of the, um, the Freedom Rides, we think, no, you mentioned Walgate, of course, we think of, um, uh, the, from about the mid-60s, the establishment of the, um, the Redfern Legal Centre, and, um, and there was a lot of um, activity in that direction, um, the growth of, the emergence of, uh, you know, a real uh, strong consciousness of, um, of Aboriginal rights, um, and yet, it, uh, in terms of the law school, it didn't seem to be really um, at the forefront there. Can you speak about that, please? I don't remember at the law school anyone ever talking about First Nation people's rights. Uh, and in this, the law school only really reflected the majority of the population. Uh, the, the majority of the population, uh, even when in 1967, the referendum was held to introduce um, a few uh, changes in the constitution. Um, there, there really wasn't a lot of uh, debate uh, and upset about the injustice. Uh, and uh, it, looking back, it's, it's rather odd even in student politics, even in the general group of agitating students, they would largely focus on the Vietnam War. Mm. And they would also focus, which came a bit later, yeah. and also focus on the inequalities affecting women, mm. uh, and also focus on the white Australian policy and the treatment of Asian people, but uh, there wasn't really any discussion, uh, and certainly not a lot of uh, engagement with Indigenous uh, issues. And in fact, there wasn't a lot of law, except hostile law, mm. law uh, supporting the rounding up of you know, people who are Indigenous, or supporting uh, of the director of Aboriginal affairs who had power over the life and the limb, or certainly the limb, and the uh, housing and other facilities for Indigenous people. In the time when I became president of the Sydney University SRC, Students' Council, um, one of the uh, Aboriginal students who was then at the university, Charlie Perkins, mm. uh, came and I, I think he was um, given a special rank as the Aboriginal, may have been the ABSCO uh, representative on the um, Students' Council. So the Students' Council, who were basically expected to be a group of agitators and uh, people who are questioning received wisdom, uh, that was uh, beginning to dawn the issues of Indigenous. But a lot of them, the burdens fell on uh, Charlie Perkins, who was very vocal and uh, he was vocal at the SRC meetings and he, he never took a step backwards, you know. He was, he was a very good influence on those who had the advantage of serving on the SRC because you had to uh, 
put up with Charlie Perkins going on beating the table and mm. making uh, very good points which were impossible to argue. Um, I was, after I left being the president of the SRC uh, and the president of the union of the University of Sydney, um, I became the honorary solicitor because I was at that stage of my career as solicitor mm. for the SRC. And, um, and I became involved in the Council for Civil Liberties. If you don't have a sexual life at the age of 21, 25, you've got to sink your sorrows in doing something else. And so I was engaged as a student's honorary solicitor representing a lot of students, many of whom went on to become QCs and judges uh, for getting arrested in demonstrations outside the American Consul General about the Vietnam War. So that was one thing. But I also got involved with um, challenges by students to the Aboriginal injustices. And they existed in Moree, where Indigenous people were not allowed to get into the pool, mm. pools, the hot pools there, and they existed in Walnut. Now the Moree bus ride, which was to some extent copying the American bus ride to the south yeah. at the same time, we do tend in Australia to follow the uh, social debates in the United States, and often that's been to our advantage sometimes not. Mm. But um, uh, in the case of Walbert, I became involved in that. Um, James Spiegel, Jim Spiegel, who was president of the Sydney SRC about five years after I was, uh, I was president in 1962 and 63. I was president twice, exceptionally. And he came along as president, I think, in about, uh, I think he he followed Geoffrey Robertson and, uh, and he became the president of the SRC. He took part in the Moree bus rides uh, and they went up to challenge the segregation of the swimming pool. And they had ultimate success. I uh, went up to Walgett with student agitators who were determined to liberate the cinema at the moment. The, the owner of the cinema allowed Aboriginals, out of the generosity of his spirit, to go downstairs into the lino floor and uh, vinyl seats. Mm. But they were not allowed to go up the grand staircase to the circle, uh, uh, paying ninepence instead of sixpence. Um, to sit uh, in the plush velvet seats and um, possibly so soil the uh, carpets upstairs. So there was this discrimination and a very fine young lawyer who was the son of a judge, a very handsome man, uh, who's, who's uh, Westcott, his surname was, uh, Owen Westcott. to end this discrimination and he went up to Walcott, I, I'm not sure that he went he'd in a bus, um, probably called the train, but he then gathered together a few Aboriginal students up there, they weren't university students but they had been identified to him and he went to the Walcott cinema and he purchased five tickets for the circle and he was given the five tickets because he was a whitey and then he hand in hand with the Aboriginal students he went up the grand staircase and the manager rushed out and said you can't go up there with these they can go downstairs we'll give you a refund this is the same movie uh, you enjoy it more downstairs uh, but uh, not upstairs then there was a scuffle and the police were called and Owen and the Aboriginal students were arrested. And then 
they sent for Kirby. And I was the student representative uh, uh, solicitor, honorary solicitor. And my, uh, my master solicitor, uh, Bruce Holcomb, uh, was very supportive of my doing civil liberties type cases. And so I um, got a team of top lawyers, Gordon Samuels, who later went on to become you know, my colleague on the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, and uh, later Governor of New South Wales. He was the lead counsel, pro bono, no fees, uh, and Malcolm Hardwick, a very conservative uh, lawyer, uh, went up as Gordon's a junior, and I went up to Walcott with them, and uh, uh, our job was to try and get them off on a technicality based on a Privy Council uh, decision at the beginning of the 20th century concerning somebody who paid a penny to have a trip on Mandy on the, one of the Sydney Harbour ferries. Um, but we lost the legal point. Uh, however, uh, the magistrate, a very wise magistrate, didn't impose a criminal penalty. He applied Section 556A, which said that without proceeding to a conviction, uh, the person could be admonished or given a bond. Or, uh, and that's what he did. And uh, so, uh, to that extent, it was a partial success. but. A fortnight or so after the case, the cinema owner quietly announced that the difference of accessibility to the Grand Circle uh, was over and all people, including Aboriginals, just by being confronted by yeah. the process, he was in a way shamed, and Walter was shamed, mm. and so they changed the uh, practice segregation was finished. Um, and there were other cases involving Aboriginals in the Council for Civil Liberties, but that was more the CCL rather than the university. And I, by this stage, had moved out of being a student agitator, and I was well on the path to being, becoming very respectable and a judge. Uh, so I didn't get involved with a lot of Aboriginal issues until they started to come before me in the Court of Appeal of New South Wales and in the High Court of Australia. I don't think I ever made a decision, and I don't think Mary Gordon ever made a decision where we had leeways for choice that was unfavourable to the Aboriginal people, mm. to the First Nations people. And then I think your involvement later too in the Australian Law Reform Commission where there was dealings with uh, Aboriginal customary laws and the like? Yes, uh, most of the work on that was undertaken by James Crawford. Mm. James had been a professor of international law at the University of Adelaide, like me, a product of public education in South Australia, uh, and uh, he, he, uh, he was invited by me to become Attorney General approved and he was appointed as a commissioner of the ALRC when Malcolm Fraser gave the Law Reform Commission a reference to study and make recommendations on Aboriginal customary law. Mm. There were other items in other references, but this was entirely on Aboriginal customary law. Mm. And James Crawford wrote a really excellent report, which is the report that still gets the greatest number of hits mm. on the ALRC, the Law Reform Commission website. Uh, and so that was something we did. And I'm proud of the report and I'm proud of, of the hits. But I'd be prouder still if one of the governments that has come to office since 1977, when the report was produced, um, 
had to implement more of the recommendations. And the problem in Australia is that often um, the legislative branch of the government will not deal with controversial questions. They just leave them in the bottom drawer. But um, anyway, that was a report. And uh, being in Sydney, James saw uh, an advertisement for the dean of the law school at the University of Sydney. So James Crawford applied, and he was successful. He was appointed uh, the Chalice Professor of uh, International Law and Dean of the Faculty of Law. And from there, he went to become the Werewolf Professor of International Law at Cambridge. Mm. And from there, he was elected by the General Assembly to be the, the judge of the World Court, the International Court of Justice. So, in, in a funny and rather indirect way, Picking in and getting him involved in Aboriginal customary law led on to a really glorious career, struck down because he died of medical complications. Uh, but he still made it to the Royal Court. He was a great lawyer and a great thinker about international law. Mm, indeed. I want to come back a little bit to the international arena. But picking, picking up that, those questions of, of discrimination and the, um, the precedents that had been set, such as the Walgett uh, case, um, the question of women and the uh, uh, discrimination against women, the law school had not allowed women to enrol for, for decades. I've been looking into uh, you know the early years of Ada Evans, for example, who was only granted admission because the then dean was, was on sabbatical, so the acting dean allowed her uh, to enrol. Uh, um, and I had an inter I interviewed uh, Margaret Thornton down in Canberra a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she was uh, 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 talking more about this, this question, that it, it, the law school, and perhaps the university as a whole, but certainly the law school, as one of the traditional disciplines perhaps, had been very exclusively a male domain uh, can you talk about that, please? Well, a as I mentioned earlier, when I arrived at the law school in 1958, uh, in our year, which was about 100 students, um, of the 100, I think it was probably about 90, 96 uh, who were women. Uh, uh, there was um, uh, Louise Ferrian, uh, and Donald uh, and um, uh, Mary Gordon came later, but Bronwyn Setright was there. And Bronwyn Setright later married uh, Alan Bishop. And she became Bronwyn Bishop. Oh, so Bronwyn uh, was not only at the law school, but she was very active in student politics a somewhat more conservative view of student politics than I had, mm. but uh, still um, uh, a lively and interesting uh, woman who uh, made a fuss. Not, I think, about women's rights or Aboriginal rights, but about um, uh, the uh, way in which uh, the academic uh, community had treated particular issues of education, she would have stuck to education issues, whereas other students at the time were getting increasingly into things like the Walcott Cinema and the Maury Baths and uh, the Vietnam War and uh, all the other issues that were agitating. So women were not very many and it changed over time. Now, of course, the majority of law students in Australia and at the University of Sydney Law School are women. Uh, and the interesting question will be to what extent has the gender change affected 
the values, uh, as Julius Stein would say, the lee ways of choice mm. that women, uh, when appointed as judges, uh, have available to them and make. Will they simply follow the footsteps of the male judges uh, who tended to be more favourable to the, um, the view of our legal system, which was propounded by Sir Owen Dixon? Uh, there are still um, a high proportion of uh, lawyers who adhere to that view. Uh, law, like other values, disciplines, is a spectrum. And um, I don't think you should assume that when a lot of women come into the laws that they'll necessarily be much different uh, than their male counterparts. You'd think they would, in a sense, because of the injustices suffered by women. As you mentioned uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, although uh, women had been uh, educated at the University of Sydney and visit to the law school, they could not get admitted to practice mm. because the judges found that they were not a person. The Act said that any person who has qualified to matriculate and is qualified in the exams that were set by the University of Sydney um, shall be admitted uh, as a solicitor, uh, a barrister, a proctor. And uh, yet the judges, and they were not only in Australia, there were these cases all through the United States and in, in uh, Scotland and elsewhere, said a, a person can be admitted, but a person has meant for centuries a man. Mm -hmm. And therefore, although the word is general, in this context it, it can't be given a general uh, uh, interpretation. This was really, in a way, Julius Stone's thesis distorted. And this was uh, ignoring the text and imposing an interpretation of the text which reflected the values of the judiciary, which were very conservative. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> um, I think this is this was part. Please don't think that. In the time I was at law school, from 1958 to 62, that women were in the forefront of agitating for an end to white Australia or to um, the rights of the indigenous people or to the rights of women. Uh, they weren't. The whole student body was very accepting and not questioning. Yes, this. Um and our community, the Australian community, was very accepting and not challenging. And yet there were some, some uh, um, signs of, of, of change, of, of progression. Yes, there were little signs, but and there's a tendency of, uh, perhaps to try and exaggerate those mm. and, uh, out of a sense of shame of what we did. But in a way, Australia was apartheid light. Mm. It was doing the same thing as in South Africa, but not building it into a lot of legal paraphernalia. And most people, when I was growing up, thought that the Aboriginal people were primitive, they hadn't built towns, they hadn't uh, established a written language, uh, they uh, uh, won't assimilate, uh, and uh, in any case, they're all going to die off and we're not going to be troubled by this issue. Mm. Um, there were paternalistic, condescending attitudes, uh, but I, I, I just don't remember that as a time uh, where the heroes of those who stood up, most of whom I think at that time were students and many of them were communists. Uh, but there weren't all that many in the major political parties. Never forget that the white Australian policy was the common principle of Australian politics, uh, supported by uh, the Conservatives and the Labour Party uh, and our National 
of federation and it remained so for most of the time up to about the time that the referendum was held in 1967. So don't please exaggerate the number of students and others who were interested. Owen Westcott stood up, Charlie Perkins stood up. I took a little step to be the lawyer for them. Gordon Samuels accepted the brief for nothing, no fee. Uh, but these were exceptions. They were little beams of light on a rather dark canvas. Yes, the, um, my, my discussion with Margaret Thornton, for example, and with others, the newer universities, UNSW, for example, was attracting people who were, who were able to uh, then uh, 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 develop more of these issues, social justice, indigenous rights, uh, whereas Sydney University was, was still languishing in that, that conservatism. Um, so um, the question, questions of change, um, uh, I'll just, I'll come to this now and, and uh, perhaps these, um, these deeply embedded uh, resistances uh, to, um, to upholding indigenous rights that go, go, go to the bedrock of Australia, um, the racism and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm working on, on a number of things, including a submission uh, uh, engaged by the Central Land Council to write a submission to the Parliamentary Inquiry into the UNGRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And all of these things, uh, this is the kind of work I, I, I seek and do, but I'm, I'm just constantly reminded, as you pointed out, that these customary law reports, the Stolen Generations reports, uh, you name it, that, that they languish um, on, on, on desks, they don't get implemented. Uh, and um, and uh, you can add the report on the grossly excessive imprisonment of young First Nations uh, people, especially males. Mm. Uh, we imprison on a per capita basis um, uh, uh, such a level that there is no other uh, race in any country that is more imprisoned than Indigenous uh, Aboriginals and the Law Reform Commission came up with a report um, and there have been suggestions even more recently uh, to change uh, the age of criminal uh, accountability and responsibility uh, but nothing tends to get done and look at the voice which is all that the Aboriginal people asked in the Uluru Statement, a voice into federal parliament. For the life of me, I can't see why this has caused so much angst. Uh, people have to realise that the First Nations people uh, speak in poetry and the rest of us speak in prose. Mm. Uh, and this is, this is, uh, quite a modest request. Uh, there's also a request, a suggestion of a treaty, mm. which I support. After all, the New Zealanders got a treaty back in 1850. Right. And most countries that were occupied by British, the British uh, had treaties of one kind or another. But we, we don't have it. People don't agree with it. And, uh, and it's just... Uh, put into the two hard basket. Mm. The new Chief Justice of New South Wales, one of Jim Spiegelman's successors, um, Andrew Bell, uh, who I think is a graduate of this law school at the University of Sydney, um, in his speech of welcome, and he was welcomed on his appointment as Chief Justice uh, this year, 2022, uh, he said what I have just said, but he couldn't, for the life of him, understand what was the big difficulty of providing a voice into federal parliament, given what we know of the neglect uh, and failure to deal with uh, the issue of um, indigenous rights. So people in high and influential positions are beginning to acknowledge uh, the wrong. 
It's a very slow chronicle. Uh, uh, absolutely, the um, the fear I think is there. I, the, the government's uh, so-called ind independent report that called for uh, uh, submissions uh, last year was uh, weakened and diminished the voice to a voice to government, and it ignored the. Um, one of the key uh, issues in Uluru, which was in entrenchment in the constitution. So, uh, I, I, I well, Mr. Know. Turnbull, who is a graduate of the Sydney University Law School, and was a pretty good prime minister, really, and uh, he did a lot of good things and was a liberal. Uh, uh, he said, No, we're not going to have a third chamber in mm -hmm. federal parliament, which is a distortion of what the Indigenous people have asked for in the Uluru Statement. Mm. Uh, I think that was one of his less glorious moments. Uh, uh, and uh, we, this is unfinished business in Australia. Yeah. We, we give acknowledgements to country, and I think that's a good thing, and it copies the New Zealanders. But they've also got their treaty, and they've got representatives in their parliament guaranteed to represent the uh, Indigenous people and they've re risen to be Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. Okay. Uh, so they do better and it's good that we're now acknowledging uh, at the beginning of speeches but I often think this is just tokenism and mm -hmm. we've got to put substance where our acknowledgement lies. Yes, with the Victorian state government I think is advancing in better ways, treaty making with the with the, uh, the Koori people down there. So I'm interested to see what happens there. Can I ask Michael what uh, before we wind this up, uh, what you're working on currently? You're still you still remain very active, very busy. Uh, well, uh, at this very moment, I'm mainly working on a very complicated international arbitration uh, in India, and. It, it concerns billions of dollars, so it's a very big responsibility mm -hmm. and it's very complex and that takes up a lot of my time. Uh, my work in human rights um, institutionally uh, um, finished on the 1st of January 2022 when my term as the co-chair of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute finished. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still looking around for something else to do in the international sphere. I do have to go to a United Nations supported conference in Geneva now that the planes are flying again uh, in September. And that's about the return of uh, human body parts and remains from museums, mm. and that will affect us in Australia because there are such body parts uh, in a number of museums. I'm going to the Australian Museum next week to speak with the director and other officers to see what we're doing in Australia on this, this issue because there have been moves recently to, uh, to deal with the um, laying to rest of people who are people to the land but um, uh, I just keep my eyes open for new opportunities um, I'm only 83 and therefore I've got a long way ahead of me my father lived to 95 and he would have lived longer if he had not been neglected by his doctor uh, and neglected himself but um, uh, one exercise that I was involved in in the 1980s has suddenly become very relevant uh, and I was a member, rapporteur and chair of an expert group of the UNESCO uh, meeting in Paris and it was concerned with a provision that exists in the UN Charter for the right of self-determination of peoples mm. and our group um, developed uh, a definition of who are a people and what is the right 
and how can you achieve the right given that it will usually be resisted by another country. And this is exactly what the Donbass and the, uh, and the dispute between the Russian Federation and Ukraine is all about. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, instead of trying to deal with it by the principles of the Charter, the Russian Federation uh, on the 24th of February just marched in and many people died and we need to settle this and settle it quickly because of the risks of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's a very urgent problem. And it's a, a four, it foreshadows future urgent problems. There are so many of these borderland disputes between different cultures and languages and religions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a flashpoint for the human species, and we're not going to get through uh, existence and the pre preservation of consciousness and the preservation of rationality if we don't solve this. So my thesis is we should go back to the work of the expert group on the rights of peoples to self-determination, mm. and that is something that uh, I'm going to try to press something certainly that the negotiators in Istanbul who are trying to find a common ground between the Russian Federation and, um, and uh, Ukraine should be looking at. Uh, they should also, in my humble opinion, be looking at making sure that NATO doesn't get too close yes. to the Russian Federation because they have security concerns uh, and okay you can say they shouldn't have done it the way they did and they've killed lots of children and uh, civilians and all of that is true but we have to find a solution mm. uh, otherwise more people will die and great risks will have to be faced yes I, I'd, I'd like to um, or we have to wind up but i'm very interested in following up many of these issues, particularly questions of self-determination for people. So I, I, I was, uh, I, I'm also seeking projects and uh, particularly around rights of peoples, rights of indigenous peoples. I also do work on climate change, which has similar urgencies yeah. about it. Well, certainly indigenous, as well as nations people, they have a right to self-determination. Yes. If they are a people, which by the definition of our expert group adopted, they certainly are, mm. doesn't necessarily mean having a different nation or, or being other than part of the Commonwealth of Australia, but it does mean they have to have self-determination, whatever that may exactly mean. It's in the Charter mm. and they are entitled to it and uh, we have to give thought to how we can deliver it. Yes, I remember some of these uh debates and discussions. I was at some of the uh, UN biodiversity meetings uh, quite a long time ago and I think the issue still remains a vexed question about people versus peoples and the fear that it in, that invokes, including by the Australian government, that this will divide and fracture the nation state. Um, so I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's been resolved in any way. Well, that, that, this is the problem. The Charter uh, deals with nation states, it is the United Nations, but it also includes in its preamble and in the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights made under the Charter and the, um, the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Common First Article, and indeed going back to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points of the Atlantic Charter uh, for the end of the Second World War. This has been a theme, the self-determination of people. And it, it is a theme, but it has to be grafted onto uh, the, um, the life of nations. Yes. And how you reconcile it in a borderland where there is a population mainly of Russian-speaking people, for example, mm. one would think that could be resolved by differential uh, referendums, uh, but 
if you just ignore it, then there's going to be war and conflict. And that, uh, as the Charter itself acknowledged, has become more dangerous because of the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. and this, uh, you know, I will probably die before this issue has been resolved, but it's a major issue for the future of the human species and the biosphere. Indeed. Well, thank you well, so much. Rather, rather pessimistic. Yes, uh, let's uh, let's uh, end on that sort of discussion. No, it's a uh, bloom. But to the extent that it's pessimistic, it should get us to move and, and to change, and especially amongst young people, mm. and especially amongst young people who study philosophy and legal philosophy and the law. This is a responsibility they have. That has been one of the things in my life. Well, it is heartening to see the young people in coming to the climate crisis, for example, taking up the issue uh, with, with force and energy and, and optimism, um, because these are real, as you say, climate crises. These are, yes, but these are turning to people. We may see them asserting themselves in uh, elections. Mm -hmm. and, New generations tend to bring new world views, and uh, I think the two big crises, uh, existential crises for humanity, uh, are uh, global climate change and nuclear weapons. Mm. And more people are speaking about climate change than about nuclear weapons. Nobody speaks about nuclear weapons. Well, the two, of course, seem to relate it in the sense that some some people advocate a return worryingly to nuclear uh, power as a form of so-called clean energy, um, uh, perhaps forgetting the, uh, the incredible risks and you know, forgetting Chernobyl and, and Maya yeah. and Fukushima. <laughs> we could have a, another very lengthy conversation about that, but you have to go and I have to go. Well, may I ask if we can meet again, perhaps on an informal basis, over coffee and uh, continue discussions? Uh, well, subject to my Indian arbitration and all the other things I've mm. got my grubby hands on, uh, yes. Thank you. That would be delightful.